Next, you'll hear from Helen Thorpe. She is the author of the book, The Newcomers, and our guest on this episode of America Trends. How are refugees being welcomed into America in 2018? My hope with this book is that because the teacher is such an engaging character and there's so much joy in the classroom, I tried to focus on that point in the refugee story where resettlement is happening and it essentially becomes a much more optimistic story. I think people are overwhelmed by bad news. And so by choosing to focus on the moment where fans feel safe and are experiencing gratitude and relief, I give the backstory so people understand the difficulty of why they had to leave their home country. But you read this book, you feel uplifted. What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. John Krofsik and Larry Rifkin back with you on America Trends. And John, you know, I know a lot of people, well, it's a little bit trite. And we get up in the morning and say, ah, this is a new day. And I'm so excited about my life. And then you go back into the same ruts. (laughs) Yeah, that happens. You know, I'm going to try something different. (laughs) And I'm just going to go and I'm going to lavish my love and attention on so many people that I have ignored over the years. And I'm going to be more attentive to the things that my wife wants me to do. And I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then we fall back into our regular patterns. Why, Why is that? I wonder. I think it's just human nature. Yeah. But I'll tell you what really excites you, I think, about a new day in an old, comfortable surrounding is to have been taken out of that for a while and placed in a very unfamiliar place where there were no conventions and nothing seemed right because you didn't really recognize what your day was going to be like. And then you come back to your old routine after a long vacation that could have been great or not so great. And you say, you know, I'm just glad to be here. You're and I absolute. should appreciate it a little more. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it takes stepping away. Right. And I've got to tell you, this podcast that we're about to do is really remarkable. Because when these individuals express the sentiment that this really is a new day and that they're really hopeful and excited, they mean it. And I'm talking about people who have fled a situation that has been untenable in human terms. They are refugees. They're people who are looking for a better life because they've come out of a war-torn area or an area where there's famine or they're coming out of camps uh, where they were really displaced people. And unfortunately, when you look around the world, John, there are just way too many people in these circumstances. Oh, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And you know, that's part of the problem I have with the news because we don't really hear about how bad it is in some parts of Africa. And and, and I don't know, it just surprises me when I see. Or when stuff. you see that somebody's been yeah. in a camp uh, for, you know, two years of their life right. and uh, the sanitation is so limited and uh, their their opportunities are nil and whatever promise they held in their own land uh, because of a civil war, whatever it may be. I mean, it's almost hard for us to understand it because we've had, while we've had a lot of ups and downs and convulsions in our society, we haven't experienced a civil no, war or we, that kind of strife. We have plenty of food we can go down to the store and get food we have heat we have even the poorest of people i think in this country have you know better amenities than some of those people that uh that have are fleeing the, the, you know those countries absolutely i mean john you are so familiar with your own home and your neighborhood and the town in which you live it's all familiar and then something may happen of course that seems unusual or unexpected, but something that culturally you are generally prepared for because it's within a certain boundary. 
our lives have a certain stability in the United States that we have been afforded because we've had governments that are pretty stable. We haven't had unrest of a sort that we couldn't in our own ways uh, try to avoid. And we've been very fortunate, John, really, as a society. Uh, we have, and we, we also have, uh, for people who are down on their luck, we have services to help them, you know, hopefully functioning properly to uh, get them back on their feet. But John, just think about it. When you go to another city, and I don't know if you feel this way, sometimes some of the bigger cities that we see on our edges like Boston or New York, and you can get a little disoriented. You say, wait a minute, I'm not in my space, my place. I know how to navigate around my right. community. And if that's disorienting on some level at times, I remember when I used to go to New York on business, John, <laughs> honest to goodness, I would get out of the train and and if I watch these New Yorkers just ramping by me, and if I wasn't ready for the pace, I wanted to get right back on the train <laughs> and come back to bucolic Connecticut saying, I can't keep up with you guys. I just can't handle this. No, you're right. The energy can be so overwhelming. So think about that in the context of becoming a real newcomer to a society yeah. and what that really means, taken out of... Even if it was a terrible situation, it might have been one that you'd grown accustomed right, to. Right. You at least know your surroundings. You know people to come to a new place and not know anybody and not know really how things function. It's Exactly. Be. Not knowing the language, the customs, the mores. Right. And yet people, because they want inherently to live a better life, when they are told that you can get out of this situation as much as you understand it and know it, and maybe you have to leave a family member. I mean, you can't even begin to imagine, at least I can't, how difficult that's got to be. Well, we are a nation of immigrants. Exactly. I mean, you know. And we have been historically very welcoming. And that's why Helen Thorpe, in this time of some uncertainty about how welcoming we are, she wanted to look at the newcomers coming to America. A lot of these young teenagers who find refuge, friendship, and hope in this American classroom in Denver, Colorado. She spent a lot of time with them, Helen Thorpe, and has done a remarkable job of putting us in their shoes. And that's not easy to do. No, that's not at all. But, you know, it, it, it's got to be done. Absolutely, John. And I think you're going to get a great appreciation for the sacrifice that uh, so many of these individuals have made to escape these horrific conditions that they found themselves in and yet uh, face an uncertain future here in the United States, not knowing whether we were going to welcome them, not knowing if they could really uh, learn all that they had to learn to become American citizens. And yet these adaptable teenagers are so remarkable. And Helen Thorpe introduces us to them in her book, The Newcomers, and here on this podcast. We are talking today to Helen Thorpe, and she is the author of the book, The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom. And it's interesting that I'm talking to you on a day when our president is tweeting out uh, an anti-Muslim snuff film. And I'm wondering if that sets the tone for the backdrop that uh, some are experiencing today as they seek uh, to come to America. Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, it does. Um, so I spent a year inside of a high school with 22 teenagers as they were learning English, and it was the 2015-2016 school year during the presidential election. And the backdrop to everything that happened in the classroom was this political conversation around refugee resettlement and whether or not it was something we should continue to embrace. Um, you know, the country historically has been very good at it, but I think we see some leaders like Donald Trump questioning whether it's a good idea out of, I think, fear um, primarily. And uh, what is sad to me watching that national conversation is, you know, I believe that fear is misplaced in the sense that we historically have done an extremely good job of refugee resettlement. We have not one single instance of admitting a refugee to this country uh, with refugee status and having that person um, then commit any kind of act of terror. It just hasn't happened. We've, you know, maybe uh, seen an immigrant 
show up. And, um, you know, uh, I think recently in Manhattan, there were there was an attack that was perpetrated by an immigrant. But that is not somebody who came to this country as a refugee. Um, that refugee status is something you earn through the United Nations and then five federal agencies here in the U.S. vet every refugee admitted to the country. And we're actually just very good at this. Um, you know, the Department of Homeland Security is involved, and they're terrific at these evaluations. Uh, and the people who come are people who are looking for a safe home. They're fleeing from violence. It's the last thing they want. And um, what they want is a safe place to raise their children, good schools for their kids to thrive in, the chance to start over. I actually think that resettlement brings out the best in us. That America has been a beacon of hope over the years, and people have been so excited about the possibility, not only of what will find them here, but what they were leaving behind and coming to. This country absolutely has been a beacon of hope. And not only that, I think that when refugees arrive from these very difficult war-torn environments that they're fleeing from, you know, the people who tend to welcome them here are often church volunteers, you know, maybe somebody associated with a synagogue that's been involved in refugee resettlement. Uh, most of our resettlement agencies are, are originally faith-based organizations and um, all of these volunteers, you know, no matter what their motivation, whether it's through the church or synagogue or, you know, whether they just simply um, are people who, who want to reach out, people find this work deeply fulfilling. Um, you know, the act of bringing used furniture over to somebody's house or bringing them food if they're in need or helping them figure out their way around town, maybe r helping them run errands by driving them around in their first weeks of arrival. These are actually some encounters that people find tremendously meaningful, and we have a whole body of people in this country very eager to do this work of welcoming people who've been through that kind of extraordinary difficulty and helping them find a safe home again here. Maybe we should uh, define a refugee vis-a-vis -vis an asylum seeker or somebody who has entered the country uh, without uh, documentation and all of the work yeah. that is done. Why don't we it's do that? It's a great that? question. Yeah, we blur these terms often in our discussions. So obviously an immigrant is anybody who's come here from another country. I'm technically an immigrant myself because my parents immigrated from Ireland with me when I was just one year old. And I grew up in this country, but I did grow up with a green card and, and so, um, you know, became a naturalized citizen. Uh, so I represent one kind of immigrant. Another kind of immigrant might be somebody who arrives here without legal permission, without document. Um, and we have a big debate in the country about whether that's healthy or not, or how to, how to fix the problem that we have, that we have so many people living here without legal status and without documents who can't fully participate in our society. The refugee is actually a different type of individual. It's a different category, and, and different laws apply. So a refugee is somebody who has experienced such extraordinary difficulty in his or her home country that they've had to literally flee their original home, and they must apply for refugee set status from a second country. There's literally no way to become a refugee, say, if you're stuck in the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, which is the number one sender of refugees to the U.S. You can't apply for refugee status from the Congo. The family that I write about in my book, they walked to Uganda, lived in a refugee settlement for seven years, and were then chosen to resettle from Uganda to the United States. Um, the U.N. is the entity that officially designates someone a refugee. And while we see many refugees from Syria attempting to enter Europe without, uh, you know, all the documents and, and legal vetting. You know, they are asylum seekers, essentially walking to Europe without your ex express invitation that they arrive. The refugees we admit to in our country are people who've received official designation from the UN and then been vetted by five federal agencies. And so we're, we're, we're well aware of who they are. We, they arrive with all the documents that they need, and they arrive with uh, specific legal protection. They're invited to live here, 
and there are refugee resettlement agencies that help them aid them in their transition. Um, and the documents that they arrive with give them a path to citizenship. So it's a kind of a distinct legal category. And our, our discussion is so fast paced and sometimes it's taking place on Twitter or in sound bites and I don't I think sometimes people don't pause to understand the distinctions between these categories. Absolutely. Thank you for doing that. I think that's very helpful. I went online to find what the UN Refugee Agency said about the nature of this problem, and it's amazing. 65.6 million forcibly displaced people worldwide. Refugees considered by that definition 22.5 million. Stateless people 10 million. Refugees resettled 189,000. Why is the number that uh, number so low so small exactly yeah well we resettle only a fraction of you know as you mentioned there are 60 million displaced people just just a third of them are officially designated refugees by the UN and we resettle only a fraction of those official refugees it's it's less than one percent the level of, of people resettled has fluctuated over time this, is, this country historically has been among the most generous, sometimes the most generous country in terms of the numbers we have admitted. In recent decades, we've seen that number be as high as, say, 200,000. At the moment, um, you know, we have decided to restrict our numbers, and they have dipped lower. Um, and in the, in the year that I was writing about, we were resettling 70,000 refugees here, other countries take refugees as well, of course. Um, you know, you see our neighbor Canada is, is a leader in refugee resettlement at the moment and re- really welcoming. They have a very welcoming environment. Um, you know, many other countries resettle refugees in addition to the United States. Um, it is very sad that we can only resettle a tiny fraction of those designated as refugees, but for the families who are chosen and who get the chance to come here, it is an opportunity to start over. And they are actually turning a corner in their journey from they're leaving difficulty behind and they're really being given a chance to thrive. Um, if they can, you know, they have to hit the ground running and, and get jobs that are not always, you know, the most fun kinds of jobs to have. They're the, it's the kind of work that you can do with very limited English. Maybe you're going to be cleaning a hotel or maybe you're going to be working in a meat packing plant. Those are the kinds of jobs that some of the parents of the students that I wrote about had. Um, but these families arrive, they, they, they're they eager to work. They take these jobs. They work incredibly hard so that their kids can go to school in the United States, get a high school degree, maybe a college degree, and have the chance to assimilate here. And what I write about is that their children in this English language acquisition classroom acquiring English, which they do actually with an you know astonishing rapidity over the course of, of this school year. And uh, I think while the parents are stuck in these low-income jobs, um, these kids are on track to go to college and really fully assimilate into our society. And their parents may make that sacrifice of a working low-income job so their kids can have an even brighter future. But for the family as a whole, to get to leave behind a refugee settlement, come here, have this kind of opportunity, they are overjoyed and filled with gratitude. And they're very perplexed by the national conversation because the last thing they want is to do anybody here harm. They are so thankful to be here so grateful and um, so so eager to become American and to fit into our society. And they're doing that as quickly as they possibly can. So and I, think and I know some of them have gotten caught up in the politics. Uh, they have been mistaken for people perhaps coming from countries where there is this question about intent. How difficult has that been for these young people whom you really followed for a year's time? Yeah. Well, you know, in the national conversation, first of all, we have kind of a mistaken idea about who's seeking to come to the U.S. And yes, there are many refugees streaming out of the Middle East and a real crisis there. That's just one third of the global issue. We have an even bigger refugee situation 
in Africa, which has been very entrenched and, 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 and it has been going on for an even longer period of time. And we have an equally entrenched, long-lasting refugee crisis in Southeast Asia. When you look at the countries sending refugees to the U.S., the number one country, both both last year and in the years that I was writing about, was the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the number two country was Burma. And you know, the preceding year, Burma had been number one. So you see, you know, Burma in Southeast Asia sending a large number of refugees here. Congo from from Africa, and then yes, we have immigrants coming from Iraq. For the most part, the Iraqi families and also families from Afghanistan, they're generally families that were working with, cooperating with the U.S. military during our conflicts there. And life has become so dangerous for them at home that they can no longer live in their home country safely because they allied themselves with the U.S. Um, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding about the families from the Middle East, I think. We, we think of the conflict there. We imagine they might be our enemy. In fact, there are close allies who are helping us in the fight against terrorism. But there's a bigger misunderstanding about the fact that the refugee crisis as a whole is much larger than simply the Middle East. So in the classroom I was in, uh, which turned out to map this global crisis very accurately, there were four students from the Democratic Republic of Congo and two from Burma and two from Iraq and others from additional countries that produce refugees. And, um, you know, these students, they just wanted to figure out how do you open a locker? Where's the cafeteria up on the fourth floor of this school? Like, can I find my way there in their first weeks here? They didn't have hardly any English at all. They were navigating this large urban high school, trying to put behind them uh, some, some, some of the difficulties they'd had in the past, figure out this new environment, and, and learn English as fast as they could. And their teacher, the man who was welcoming them, you know, his background, his, his, his father's Anglo, his mother is Latina, and his mom grew up in a Spanish-speaking household, and he is fluent in English and Spanish. But he's got kids in his classroom who speak 14 different languages. And his job is to teach all of them as much English as he can by the end of the school year, which it was, I thought, a heroic thing for me to get to witness. Absolutely. That's Eddie Williams. Let me ask you, the the issues that they were escaping in their home countries, uh, how did you see that manifested in their behaviors or concerns about what they were going to experience in America or their just sheer joy that they were now out of that situation. What did you see? Right. Well, the predominant thing that I saw was joy at being here. So even at one moment, a teacher asked one of the students, um, this actually wasn't Eddie Williams. It was in, in another classroom. A teacher asked, what are you most grateful for? And uh, one of the boys from the Democratic Republic of Congo wrote down to live in a safe country because he just had not had that opportunity before. Um, and, and, and to live in a place where he felt secure and there wasn't this constant risk of militia groups um, threatening his, his well-being or every, you know, the well-being of everybody he loves. That's what he was most grateful for. Um, in general, the kids arrived and were so thankful to be safe and in an environment where they could trust their teacher and um, feel secure that the classroom quickly began to sort of bubble with joy as the kids gradually learned enough English to interact with one another and form friendships and flirt and fight and you know do all the things that teenagers do. Um, but of course... Some of the kids had experienced extreme difficulty, traumatic things, and for them it was a struggle to put those things in the past, and it was an ongoing process. And I saw them evolve over time and manage to put these things um, more in the past over time. But, But at the outset of their time here, it was hard for them to orient themselves in the classroom. I'm thinking when I say this of two young women from Iraq sisters named Jacqueline and Mariam. Um, they had left Iraq uh, during the height of, of the Iraq war 
their father had sided with the U.S. military and vanished. Was was he had been um, the target of death threats, and he was most likely killed because he cooperated with the U.S. military. And they left Iraq seeking a safe home, and they went to what they thought would be a safe country, and that was Syria. And they were living in Damascus when the Syrian civil war began, and they saw terrible car bombings in their neighborhood. And to put that sort of thing behind them, it just takes time. And when they arrived in this country, they were still grieving the loss of their father and letting go of what they had witnessed in Damascus. And they were also actually still worrying about the safety of of some of their friends who were, you know, refugees from Syria uh, who had also been living in Damascus and and were in the middle of trying to make that difficult walk to Germany and, and, you know, getting to Germany by boat and by, by foot. So they just had so much on their minds and so much going on. Um, And because they spoke Arabic, a language that's pretty far from English, you know, they were really struggling at the outset to learn as much English as others in the classroom. Although they did succeed in time, they were slower in their learning. So depending on what the kids had in their past, depending on how close their language was to English in its origin, um, you know, they learned at varying rates. But all of them made immense strides over the course of the year. And, And I would say that what I was most awed by was watching uh, these two brothers from the Congo learn so much English that in the following year they entered mainstream classes and started reading To Kill a Mockingbird. It's Re- incredible. Remarkable. When we think about it, uh, there are a couple of things going on in America that uh, make it quite interesting to hear you talk about this and to read your book, The Newcomers. One is that we are so removed from that kind of violence, dislocation, um, just resettlement needs, and, uh, you know, living in such an uncertain environment. We're so far removed from that. Most of our wars have been some other place, and uh, our homeland, other than at 9-11, has been basically untrammeled uh, by these kinds of circumstances. Yet we are also, perhaps historically, the most welcoming country. So I guess my question is, do we get this wrong? right most of the time? Most of the time, we do get this right. And quite quite candidly, I'm confident that in the future, we will do more of this work. I say that because there are so many refugees, and we have this long history of, of doing this work and doing it well. And I believe we will get through the current political moment where we are so fearful that We have forgotten that we're very good at this. So, you know, I don't know if it's going to be uh, next year or in four years or in five or ten, but we will return to being a leader in this work is is my hope and my belief. Um, The current political moment, um, I, I feel, you know, we could have a healthier conversation if we remembered how good we are at this. And if we developed, took, took this time to develop a better understanding of refugee resettlement and um, who does the work, why they find it fulfilling, and how we, how we have succeeded at it. We'll return to this episode of America Trends in just a moment. If you like what we're doing here at America Trends Podcast, please don't keep it to yourself. I know there are a lot of people, John, who think, well, if I'm listening and somebody else wants to listen at the same time, maybe we're going to collide and they're not going to be able to hear us. Is that the way the technology works? No, there's plenty of bandwidth. Everybody can listen at the same time. All right. Well, that dispels that that myth. (laughs) Now, you can do a number of things that would really be helpful to us. You could give us a kind rating or a review at Apple Podcasts, and that boosts what they consider to be our value and visibility. And what does that do, John? Well, that puts us in the forefront so that you can find us easier, and most important is other people can find us easier. And you can subscribe there or on our site, americatrendspodcast.com, or wherever you're listening, so we can alert you to new episodes of the podcast, which, by the way, 
we put out twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And stay in touch with us on both Facebook and Twitter at Trends Podcast. Or you can like us on Facebook or follow us where, John? On Twitter. On Twitter. That's yeah. right. Where the world turns to hear fake news or whatever yeah. it is. Well, well you can us, direct though, we message have us news. at Trends Podcast <laughs> or using hashtag Trends Podcast. And you know, John, with our growing audience, and really it's been pretty remarkable, a lot of people just came to us the last month or two, and they might have missed earlier episodes. Can they get them again? They can look through them and, and uh, pick the ones they want to listen to. They're all on the website, and a lot of them are up on iTunes, many of them. All right. Well, listen, there's lots of material to listen to. We hope you have the time and will lend it to us because we try to make it worth your while. And thanks so much for listening. And tell your friends. We now return to this episode of America Trends. And since these young people whom you followed have uh, suffered so much in their early lives, coming to America, even with some of the uncertainties, and they did play out for some of your students. I mean, there were some students who were verbally assaulted, others who were mistaken in terms of their identity, and uh, some questioning whether they were loyal to the U.S. How would you on the main describe uh, the way that these kids felt they were being Welcome to America. Yeah. Um, You know, overall, these students found a very accepting environment inside their high school, which is a high school that has a lot of history welcoming this population, and about a third of the high school's foreign-born, very sophisticated staff, very familiar with the parts of the world that these kids come from. Outside of their high school, sometimes... It, the environment was not as welcoming. And they ran into particular difficulty actually commuting to and from their neighborhoods where they found affordable housing to this high school, which is the designated place in the school system where kids are sent if their schooling's been interrupted by war or if they arrive speaking foreign languages other than Spanish. So they have these long commutes. And sometimes on the buses or the light rail trains, other commuters would say things to them, especially to the young women who are wearing headscarves or covering your hair. Um, and as you allude to, you know, oftentimes those students are actually from, say, Bangladesh or, you know, another Africa or another part of the world entirely than the Middle East. But to someone who doesn't understand that covering your hair is common in many parts of the world, they see that and they just think Middle East, you know, must be a terrorist because we have these stereotypes or these ideas in our mind. And they're often misreading Uh, the students' actual identities and misreading the countries that the students are from. I know that you say that you have grown a lot in this process of documenting the lives of these newcomers here to the United States, but you also learned a lot, not only in the classroom, but by going back to the Congo and uh, visiting with a gentleman, a young man, Stephen, the cousin of Methuselah, a Congolese boy that uh, you met at South. And what was it that you were expecting Stephen uh, to say to you about, uh, you know, how his cousin was doing in America? And what did you meet in him uh, in the Congo itself? What, what kind of reaction? So um, after the end of the school year, I did travel to the Congo, and I was fortunate enough to go with uh, military instructors who were from the Air Force Academy in Colorado Springs who were looking at demilitarization in that country. And Methuselah's family had been forced to leave the Congo because the environment was so extreme on the eastern side of the country where they lived. There were so many armed militia groups swooping down on villages, stealing crops, uh, killing or, or, or abducting or harming people. So most of Methuselah's extended family had fled their home village, and they had walked for months to get to this refugee settlement in Uganda. And after I was in the Congo, I went to Uganda and, and visited the refugee settlement and found Methuselah's relatives and his cousin, who I, I thought it would be affirming to, to show him pictures of Methuselah in the United States, and I wanted him to know that his cousin was thriving. And I I shared these images of Methuselah happy in his American classroom, 
And what I didn't understand, of course, I should have known, and I just didn't understand that it would it would hit this other boy this way. You know, when he looked at these photographs, he saw an American classroom where his cousin Lysosola was, and, and that classroom had carpets and books and laptops and electricity. And at the refugee settlement, kids are going to school in very different kinds of facilities if they're at school at all. And they don't have books. They don't have any laptops. There's not electricity in their classrooms. Kids are, you know, there, there are schools in the settlement, but kids are only really able to stay generally, maybe through elementary school, if that. A bunch of them leave after third grade, and they're leaving school to grow crops in the field, to help their families have food, to gather firewood so they can have some way of cooking that food because, of course, they're living in huts with no way to cook other than you know burning this wood that they have to go scavenge. They're collecting water for their families. It's an incredibly difficult existence. It is subsistence living. And to be stuck in that environment looking at photographs of a happy cousin in America, it was heartbreaking to this other boy, you know, terribly difficult. And, and I upset him by showing him these, these images. And I, I think it was devastating to him. And he uh, looked at me and, and with a tone of, uh, uh, like, hardened resolve, but almost a little bit of bitterness, said, well, tell Methuselah to earn a lot of money and send me some money for tuition so I can keep going to school, you know. And um, to me, he represented all of the kids who were not chosen to resettle and, and not chosen to live here. Um, we know now from your book, and it is a brilliantly written book and certainly puts a, a face on uh, stories that are very remote and distant from our own experiences. But you do teach us, that refugees teach us, that it is really possible to lose everything and then build a new life in America. For those who have no experience in resettlement, you say that they really enjoy the experience and get so much from it. You got so much from it. In this period of uncertainty in America, for those of us who want to gain a greater understanding of what it is that we can do to move this issue into a different place in our public dialogue, what would you say to us? We do have this idea, I think, implicit in a lot of our rhetoric around resettlement. We have this idea that refugees are a burden. And some of us feel that's not a burden we want to shoulder, and others of us think, well, maybe I should shoulder that heavy burden. And in truth, after I had the chance to spend a year in a classroom with these students, and after I had the chance to get to know several families whose kids are in that room closely by visiting them repeatedly over the course of the school year and having lots of meals with them and and even getting to know some of the resettlement workers who, who worked with those families. What I found was I just gradually felt my eyes being opened when the Congolese family was resettled here. The aid worker helping them took them around their apartment and said, this is a stove, and taught them how to operate the stove. They had never had a stove before. And he said, this is what a fire alarm sounds like. And he, he, he set off the fire alarm so they could know what that noise meant. Um, he showed them how to turn on and off the lights. You know, where they had been living, they didn't have light switches and fire alarms. They were, they were living in a hut they had constructed themselves. Our lifestyle is so utterly different from the way some people on this globe live. And we can forget that. We can, you know... In this classroom, there were students who had never taken a hot shower at any point in their lives. And, you know, we have a huge range of income in this country, and we have, we have many rich people and many poor people, uh, or, or, you know, many middle-class people and a few very rich people and many poor people. But uh, most of us have the chance to take hot showers. And to be in a room and to get to know families whose lives were um, so much harder in their home countries and in the places where they had been living. For me, it taught me to appreciate everything that I had been taking for granted. And it also, watching people 
land here, to take the Congolese family again as an example, their father got a job as a dishwasher. Um, the boy's older brothers got jobs cleaning hotels. You know, so to watch these families land here and within three months' time get those kinds of jobs, start working, be economically self-sufficient, be entirely off any kind of income subsidy, um, you know, not their their one-time grant of about a thousand dollars per person um, in that family had had vanished, you know, during their first months, and and they were able to make that transition and become economically self-sufficient. Uh, to watch that happen, the extraordinary resilience of of this family, watching them start over in this way, I was awestruck, and they didn't feel like a burden to me. I found getting to know these individuals and watching the transformation they were going through, I found it a gift. To me, these families were a gift. And that's how volunteers who work with them feel about their experiences getting to know these families. And that's how the teacher felt about his students in the room. I mean, he thought it was an extraordinary experience to have 22 kids from around the globe and to get the chance to know each of them individually and learn a little bit about their home country, even as he was teaching them English. He thought it enriched his world. So I, I feel like there's a kind of a, a misunderstanding on the part of the, the, the some here who, who don't don't maybe have the, the opportunity to do resettlement work about about what it is and what it's like to interact with these families. Well, I know we've been using our ears on this podcast, but you've opened our eyes. And uh, what an observation and what a position you have placed us in uh, to understand and to go out and uh, not only read your book, but also think a little bit more about this issue of refugees and resettlement. Thank you so much for being with us today on America Trends Podcast. The book is called The Newcomers, Finding Refuge, Friendship, and Hope in an American Classroom. And our guest has been helped. Helen Thorpe. Helen, thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate the chance to talk. Thanks.